My name is Jeffrey Michael Schonk Jr. I'm 34 years old. I was raised in a military family. My dad was in the Navy. Uh, spent majority of my childhood in Sicily. Luck behold, lucky. To some people, it's lucky, but to me, it was, all my friends were constantly moving. Um, that's. I guess I wanted to join the military when I was a kid. Um, I'm a dad. Like, I don't know, man. You want me to talk about myself? That's not very good for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm just a medically retired uh, stay-at-home dad that has been enjoying life since my injury. So when you first joined the military, how does it work when it comes to going to a combat zone? Did you choose to go over there or does the military decide where you go? Uh, we kind of get told where we're going to go. Uh, your unit comes up on orders and then they get told to us when we're going to be leaving, how we're going to be leaving. And we are given a time frame of like when we get to go say hi and bye to our families and whatnot. But. No, everything's pretty much you're told when we're leaving, when we're where we're going to deploy. And then once we get to where we're going to go, you're told where you're going to go from there. So tell me about your experiences in Iraq prior to the shooting that took place. Um, I vaguely remember it. Um, it was. It was something that I always wanted to do. So when I got there, I was kind of naive. I didn't really pay attention to everything like I should have been. Um, I remember we were walking from the talk back to the American side of the of the base. And they were going off about they were going to have a controlled debt. Me not really thinking anything. It was a controlled debt. Uh, I was with one of my NCOs and when everything went off, he he screamed at me about slamming down to the ground to get cover. Um, but other than that, it was pretty much like the same thing, same job, same thing that I did on the in the states. I did over there. I'd wake up, go over, make sure the satellites were running, make sure everything was going good, and then sit and keep track of basically making sure that the system didn't go down so everybody could talk. Um, we got there, I want to say I got to Iraq in July. Yeah, July. And it was a lot of, you're going here, you're going there. I didn't know where, I, where the hell I was going. I was just doing what I was told. Um, so we went from Ramadi down to Fallujah. Fallujah was a complete different, um, I don't want to say vibe, but basically made everything feel different than what Ramadi was. The rules were a lot more laxed, let's say that. Um, but no, it was pretty much wake up, go to work, come back, go to sleep, eat, repent, uh, and repeat. Um, yeah. So, can you tell me everything that you remember about September 23rd, 2010, starting with the first thing you remember doing that day up until the end of the evening? Nothing. I, I fortunately, but unfortunately, remember absolutely nothing from that day. So you don't remember, like, gunshots going off or anything? No, not at all. Huh. I do, you remember. Think that, do you think that has to do with a brain injury then? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I believe it has everything to do with the brain injury. Um, I spent years asking all the doctors that I knew, uh, am I ever going to get my memory back? It's there. 
any chance that it could happen. And it was a pretty consistent, your brain works its way around traumatic events like that and it blocks it out. For some people it comes back, but for many it, it doesn't. Um, I remember waking up in the hospital asking why everybody was around me. Not it, I thought I went to bed in Iraq and then next thing I know I woke up and I had my whole family around me. I didn't know what the hell was going on. So can you talk about what did happen uh, if you're comfortable doing so? Uh, so from what I was told around 11 o'clock, 1130 that night of September 23rd, Platero walked in and shot myself, John Carrillo and or yeah, and Gieber Noonan. Um, from what I was told, he unloaded an entire magazine, a 30 round magazine on the three of us. He dropped his magazine. He put another magazine in, fired a few more rounds, put his weapon on safe, then put it down on his bed and walked out like nothing happened. And then it was at that point in time that our one of the interpreters came out and tackled him to the ground. And he was one of your roommates at the time, correct? Platero was, yes. Yes, there was four of us that uh, lived in that room. I had only moved into that room like two weeks prior. I was in the room with my NCO. Um, and somebody didn't like that a lower enlisted was roomed with a, an, an NCO. So they complained about it and put all of us that were lower enlisted into the rooms together so that the NCOs could all have their own rooms. Do you remember when you did find out that there was a shooting and that two of your roommates had passed away? Do you remember? Do you remember that much? I remember being told. So. Oh, yeah, actually, I remember being told uh, I, I had come out of my coma. I've been in a coma for a few weeks. It was a medically induced coma to help the uh, swelling go down in my brain after the craniectomy. Um, and up until they brought me into the court martial whole proceeding stuff, they tried to keep me away from the news, from basically any type of electronics, both for to help heal my brain injury or help heal my brain and also keep me away from any outside influences that could help, um, I guess, excuse me, sway my story. But I want to say it was around Christmas time that I was finally told that Givra and John had both died from their wounds and they didn't even make it out of that room. It, it, it broke my heart. It, still hurts but that's part of life i guess did you have any um contact with platero before or after the shooting like in court or anything like that given vi victim impact statements or anything of the sort um so no i didn't really talk to platero at all um he would walk past the smoke pit uh, I guess on his way to work or whatever, and he'd make little snide comments like if one more person pisses me off, I'm going to blow up, blah, 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 stuff like that. But I chalked it up to we're in a place where no one wants to be. We're being told to do things that we don't want to do. So, like, obviously, you're going to be butthurt about something. Um, I didn't think that he would come in and shoot us. But I, I was actually ordered to not talk to him so i have not been able to send any letters anything uh so there's been no contact whatsoever i remember when we walked into i'm sorry i'm not trying to jump off somewhere um during the court martial i they i i remember bits and pieces of that 
during the court martial hearing, and I remember reading that those were going to be the next things, but so I apologize. Um, they kept me away from everybody. And when it was my time to give testimony, they had me walk in front of him and basically sit and stare at him during my my testimony in which he just sat there and stared like he was looking at a wall. But there's been no contact whatsoever. Um, yeah. No Did he make eye contact with you while you were up there? No. None whatsoever. I sat and I stared at him. I wanted him to make contact. I wanted him to look at me, but he wouldn't look at me at all. So he claims to be innocent, and there's a petition online in which 366 people have signed who believe he's innocent as well. What do you think about that? Um, everybody's allowed to have their own opinion. I don't think he's, in, he's innocent. I've, there's four people in a room, and one person walks out, and three people are dying. I mean... Unless a ninja chicken came in and did it, it kind of all points at the thing. From what I know as well, my weapon, actually all three of our weapons were far enough away from us where we were not able to do anything. Uh, all, all those people claiming that he's innocent, like I said, everybody can have their own opinion. Uh, I want to, his sister, uh, harassed me for years telling me that I was lying and I needed to say the truth and everything well like I just said there's four people that walk in a room three people are shot one person walks out I mean it's kind of even a kindergartner could figure that one out um Yeah. Sorry, man. It's okay. It's totally fine. Uh, what was the aftermath of your health, both mental and physical, once you got back home? All right. So, oh, I, my parents, they flew, they flew my sister and my parents out to Germany. And they only ever do that if you're not expected to make it. Uh, well, luckily I did. Um, but when I came out of my coma, they woke me up and everything. They they sat around and they told my parents and myself that they didn't think that I would ever walk or talk again because I had such a severe TBI. Um, they wanted to amputate my left leg because I was so I was shot in my head, my right hand, and my left leg. Well. Um, the left leg, I was missing four and a quarter inches from my tibia, and my fibula was basically like a puzzle piece. They had to put those pieces back together to make everything back. Um, for 11 months, 11 and a half months, I regrew that space in between my tibia using utilizing an X-fix, an external fixator. Um, they had to cut at the top of my tibia and we twisted a millimeter a day actually i'm sitting here looking at it right now as i speak this right here the external fixator is what i had on my leg and they moved this piece down well i moved it a millimeter a day so that I could regrow my tibia. Um, I can tell you that I would much rather be shot again than doing that. That, that was painful. Um, and then on the left side of my head is titanium. So I get to have fun when I go into airports. But only the Miami one so far. Um, health-wise, it's 
it's it's doing better. I'm doing better. My injuries have prevent. I don't want to say prevented me, but kept me away from what I always wanted to do. It was my the army was my dream job. I at like five years old knew that's what I wanted to do. My grandfather was in the army. Both actually, both of them were. My dad was in the military. It's just something I wanted to do. Um, but then after getting shot, the injuries kind of made me have to change my life. So I've had to find things that are easier, so to speak, as far as mental capacity goes. I like to tell people I play stupid on TV. So have you been diagnosed with PTSD or any mental illnesses since getting back to civilian life? Uh, yeah, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, it took, I don't want to say a lot of therapy, but it, it took a lot of work to recognize that I needed it, needed to go to therapy, that I needed to make sure that I could be a better person and not let my, for lack of a better word, shortcomings in the mental department go. Um, it, I pushed myself, I went to school. Um, that was fun. But I want to say that the, the diagnosis and everything has, has really, I guess we could say gave me an answer as to why I am the way I am. But it also helped me realize that you can pretty much overcome anything as long as you push forward. So I had to go to therapy knowing that I couldn't let the fear that I was associating with everything and the uh, survivor's guilt that I had get me down because I have kids that I still need to show that you, you got to get through it. So if you could say anything today to Specialist Platero, what might that be? You're a fucking dickhead. Um, yeah, that, actually, that would be perfect. You're a dickhead. Um... Honestly, I don't think I'd have anything to say to him. I wouldn't want to talk to him. I I thought I wanted answers, but I think there's some doors that don't need to be opened. Not for me. Right, that's understandable. So if the shooting hadn't have happened... What would you see your life like, not only serving, but after getting back to civilian life? Excuse me. Um, I, th I would still be in the Army right now. Uh, I was very much, when I joined, I had, the, I had the mindset of I'd have no plan on getting out. I wanted to stay in until they told me to get out. And... That's kind of what happened. Um, yeah, I don't. I I think life would be different, but I would still be. I wouldn't have kids, and I would still be. I would still be in the military or in the army. So, is there anything that you'd like the public to know about this case, or anybody involved in this case, for that matter? I mean, if, that's a good question, but hell, whatever you know, I want to know too. No, I'm just kidding. Don't say that. I shouldn't have said that. Um, no, I don't think there's anything. I mean, there's been times where I wanted, an like I said, I wanted answers, but it's, It would only stress me out and probably cause more issues to me 
if I got more answers. Well, not answers, but if, if I was shown something that I wasn't supposed to see or whatever it is that could possibly happen. But realistically, out of this, out of anything, out of what I went through, everybody should make sure that they live their life. Don't, don't, don't let fear hold you back and go for it. Follow your dreams, do everything you can, because as a, as, as I well know, it, it, it could be taken. My friends, they're not here anymore. My buddy's kids will never see their dad. And that breaks my heart. Are you still in uh, contact with their family? Uh, occasionally, I talk to John's widow. But no, not really. I don't, I, I don't really associate with anybody from any of that. The Noonan family, they kind of, well, not all of them. A lot of them, when everything started going better for me, started becoming mean towards me, saying that I was making off off their <clears throat> dead son's name and this, that, and the other. And I was just trying to enjoy life because I still am alive. And that's what, I'm, that's what you're supposed to do. Right. Yeah, that's understandable. But, you know. Shit, I wish I had better answers for you, man. Oh, no, it's totally fine. It's it's this case. Um, when I came across it, I thought it was pretty interesting that not much media coverage was, you know, on this case. I, I feel like it was kind of swept under the rug. And I was talking to a, a friend of mine who was in the army, and he told me that uh, during a training, one of his friends was accidentally shot and killed. And that wasn't in the media at all. And it was just swept under the rug. And he was telling me things like this happen all the time because I was telling him yeah. about this case. And he's like, man, if you only knew what the Army and Marines do to cover up cases of people dying in the military, it just blows my mind. Well, well, OK, so so thinking about right. it that way, absolutely, I agree. And if, if it in regards to answers about this case. I think everybody should know how much green on green happens. Like the amount of stuff like this that gets covered, like just brushed under the rug is really bad. And like, say for my case, um, I was in the, I lived in the hospital for roughly two years straight. Um, and there was people constantly coming in that were, they were getting purple hearts. They were getting their awards and shit, and I had to watch as people were constantly getting purple hearts. But when I put in for mine, I was told I didn't qualify. And I looked at him and I said, well, if I got shot by somebody that's in the same unit as me or in the same uniform as me, that now makes him an enemy, a domestic enemy. And when we sign up foreign and domestic enemies, like at this point in time, homie's a, an enemy now. Um, so I got denied for all that stuff. Um, but what I would like for everybody to know is, yeah, how much this actually happens and the severity of it. Like there's, yes, there's people that just get hurt, but like in my instance, there's people that died and they should, I don't want to say they should get recognition or anything, but they should get justice in a way that isn't really given to them because everything's been pushed under the rug. Right. So before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to end with or talk about that we haven't covered yet? Um. I don't know, man. Like I said, it's been some years since I talked about it. No. I think that 
I, as much as I am still alive, it is fortunate that I'm still alive. I would, I would, I would have been eternally grateful had all three of us survived. Just because I know that my buddy's son will never see his dad. He was only, he was only a few months old when this all happened. Well, I want to thank you for your time today and thank you for your service. I'm sure it's not easy talking about it, but. It's not hard. <laughs> oh, sorry. My something I, I thought I thought we just disconnected because it just went down. But yeah, thank you for your, your time and service. And I'm sure it's a little hard to talk about, you know, what went on and kind of le relive that trauma. Well. I think honestly, I think it would be harder if I did remember bits of it. But like I said, fortunately and unfortunately, I don't remember anything from that day. Um, I've tried and I've tried, but nothing happens. But I appreciate it, man. Yeah.